Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ansible and Install Profiles at Drupal Camp North. As I said earlier, I actually got the right title on here this time. Brilliant. Um, uh, so yeah, just um, a bit about me. My name is Jenny Tian. Um, I work under the name of Delicious Creative. I'm essentially just a Drupal freelancer, but that way I get lots of calls from companies saying, can I speak to somebody in marketing? And I go, don't call back. Um, just, makes me sound a lot more important, which is always a good thing. Um, I started a tradition last year here that I've done ever since, where instead of going on and on and on about how great I am and how long I've been doing Drupal at the beginning, I decided to, to always say like three random things. So I'm really into Columbo, and quite often like Sundays, like my, my most perfect thing is like big breakfast, watch Columbo all day. I set up my DVR to record them all, and yeah, so I watch a lot of Columbo. I think I like figuring out things out. It's like, I like watching him figure things out. So maybe it helps my Drupal in some sort of weird way. Um, <clears throat> somehow, magically, this sticker appeared on a pole outside my office. Now, <laughs> I don't know how that happened. And recently, it went missing. And the thing is, somebody took that sticker off the DrupalCon, but left all the other stickers on the pole. So like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's happening there. So I'm starting to like put more stickers on the pole. We'll, we'll see what happens. And um, is that kettle in the middle tiny or far away? <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I was shopping for a kettle. That, that, that really kind of, um, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I still haven't figured it out. Every so often, I look at that photo, and I'm like, what? So um, yeah, what is this going? What's this all about? Uh, currently, I'm working on a project that um, I decided to build as an install profile. And it's quite large project. There's big migration and a lot of other complex stuff. And I thought there's a lot of chance for me to screw things up along the way. And I thought I'd just build it as an install profile. Because also, I, I kind of like doing things that way. They're, it's a very nice way of building like one site, not just something to do over and over and over again. Um, and in, in doing so, if you've ever done any install profile work, um, you kind of need something to help you along to rebuild and reinstall for you because you end up reinstalling things over and over and over and over again. And it's the kind of thing that you're not going to want to click through. Um, Drush is incredibly helpful for that with the Drush site install command. Um, but having something that actually runs the install for you is a massive help. Um, and I started doing that when I was working on the Tasty backend install profile. And much like James was saying in his talk about going through the review process, maybe one of these years I'll actually do it and it'll actually be official. Um, so problems with the site I was working on, one of the major things is there's a 16 gigabyte files directory in the old Drupal 6 site. This is also uh, a migration from Drupal 6 into Drupal 7 that I'm currently working on. And me and my lowly MacBook Air that I've been using for three and a half years is perpetually running out of space. So I wanted to make sure that during my build and my, my reinstall and everything else I'm doing, I could um, point the Drupal files directory out to an external hard drive because I don't want to store all these 16 gigs of files on my laptop. And in my initial tests of all, all my migrations, I wanted to make sure I could move them all properly. So I needed to have 32 gigs free for all of that, even though now with my, my migrations, the source and destination are the same, so I don't have to duplicate anything. But when I initially was writing them, I wanted to make sure all of that worked just in case. Because also, right before the site goes live, I'll be pulling down all the latest database, all the latest files, etc. I want to make sure that was fine. And I just thought I don't have the room on this thing. So if one of these years, I'll buy a new laptop as well. Um, so that was a problem I, I started to face. And I thought, well, you know what? I can sim link this out in one of my usual kind of shell scripts that I use to rebuild my sites when I'm making install profiles. But I've also been messing around a lot with Ansible lately. And I kind of thought, you know what? This is a really nice fit. Because I've been gotten involved with Ansible a little bit over the kind of past six months to a year, still fairly new to it. But I'm using it a lot to configure servers I run for clients. And I've just started to use it as kind of just a little helper. It's like my little assistant that does stuff for me that if I'm going to do something twice, I'll write an Ansible playbook or an Ansible role for it. And then that way, I can keep doing it over and over again. And it's a lot better than like little scripts I'd end up with that kind of end up all over the place in different formats and stuff like that. So what is Ansible? Anybody here heard of Ansible, use Ansible? No? I know, I know definitely a few people have. Okay, so they all feel you, but not that many. Um, according to Ansible, here's their website. It's DevOps made simple. Um, their tower thing was like kind of their uh, like official kind of UI for it and stuff like that. Um, but 
So they say it's a powerful automation tool that you can learn quickly, and that's very true. One of the reasons um, I, I picked Ansible to start with is that it's the, the, what, what you interact with Ansible is through a series of files, and those files are written in YAML. And hey, Drupal 8, it's all over that. So I was like, cool, this is going to be very consistent. So I've, I've got one way of writing these, all my, all my tasks and everything I'm working on in my Ansible stuff, and in that way, same kind of syntax, same sort of indentation, everything else, which is great for in Drupal 8. So that kind of you know, instead of having to learn some other way of doing things, I can just do things like that. Um, so it's, it's often used for configuration management, deployment, automation things, so setting up servers, deployments to servers, um, things along those lines. But um, you can use it for anything, really. If you can do it on the command line, you can do it with Ansible. Um, if you're writing scripts for something, you can do it with Ansible. And through this, I'll show you why I, I'd much rather use Ansible than writing scripts. Um, Stuff like that. So it's, it's kind of just, you know, something that does stuff for you. Um, once again, the files are written in YAML, which is great. That makes it consistent with Drupal 8 sort of stuff. Um, it uses Jinja 2 templates. Also, I'm going to go through some of this stuff kind of quick. This is by, by no means the be-all, end-all of Ansible. I just want to give you a bit of an overview of it. Um, Ansible itself is written in Python, but I believe that you can write modules for Ansible in any other languages. I'm not sure, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't do any Python. Um, it runs over SSH, so when you need to connect to a server to do whatever it is you're doing, it just goes from wherever you're running it out to the server, it does what it does. It's agentless, which means you don't have to install anything on the nodes it's configuring. So if you've got 15 servers that you need to run the same sort of Ansible stuff on, you don't have to install anything on those 15 servers, it'll just work. Um, it's licensed under the GPL. And the basic way it works is you have a control machine that configures other machines, often referred to as nodes. So there's probably some nice terminology overlap here, which is great. Um, so it, essentially, for the most part, I run all my Ansible stuff on my laptop. It goes out to my servers. It does stuff. But you can have a server somewhere that then goes out and configures or runs everything on all your other servers. So you kind of, kind of have a, like a master-slave relationship with all that sort of stuff. Um, and it can also run locally. Um, one of the things I use Ansible for is setting up virtual hosts that are on my Mac. So instead of having to manually do all that stuff, I just plug my variables into my playbook, and it runs and configures this laptop. And other people I know, actually, when they buy a new laptop, they have Ansible roles that configure the entire laptop, which is cool, because it means that you drop your laptop in the river, and you need to get a new one, not that I recommend that, um, and you, you run the playbook, and everything is set up exactly as it was before, which is one of the best things about Ansible. Um, so yeah, you can use it to set up local vhost, dependencies, local vhost, dependencies, manage tools, you have anything else. So it's, once again, if you can do it on the command line, you can do it with Ansible. So it just does stuff. It's incredibly consistent because when you're running the playbooks over and over again, it's going to configure things as you've set it up. And you know what? If you log into the server and you manually change something and you run your playbook, it's going to pervert it back. So always put everything in there, but it also means that everything is consistent. I know that I've been somebody in the past where I've logged into servers and installed that and tweaked this, and then by the end of it you go, I have no idea what I've done to this. And then if you need another one, you go, well, I don't remember what I did to this server. I Googled something and there we go, it's in there. But if you put it all into a playbook or something like this, then no matter what, it's the same thing every single time. Um, it also means that you can trash and rebuild very easily. You've screwed something up, oh no! Kill it. Rebuild it. You're going, to get, you're going to go back to where you were before, which is awesome, especially if you're doing things with install profiles. Because if you screw something up or, 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 or anything else with Drupal, you can always try to rebuild. <laughs> you're not tied to a certain thing. A lot of people um, sometimes have a concept of a, a top site that a team kind of works toward. But that's very precious. What happens if something goes wrong in that top site? Then what? You know, with, with doing something along these lines, you can kill it, and you can rebuild it, and it's right back to where it should be. Um, so a brief overview of some terminology. Going quite slow here. Modules and nodes. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Modules are essentially similar things as Drupal modules in that you use Ansible modules to do a specific task. There are modules that are designed to do certain things. Um, nodes are just the actual machines that you're running this playbook up against. Um, so, yes, yeah, so as, as an example, the apt module, so if you're installing something on an Ubuntu server, you're going to use apt get install whatever. Um, that's big enough, but why not? Yeah, I guess it's 
I get. So as you can see, we're calling the app module, saying install Apache 2, make sure it's there, and then we have a handler that's going to run after the fact. Same thing, if you need to create a file or a folder, you use the file module. So we're saying file module, path equals the, the directory we need to create. Um, it's a directory and we want it to be 755. So the nodes in the machines, you're configuring tasks are just basically an individual thing. Install Apache, install this PHP module, install whatever. Install failed to ban, there we go, once again. This is an example of a task. Notice it looks similar to the other things. There's various ways in Ansible of writing out the things you're doing. I'm not going to cover that. There's lots of documentation out there on, on that. There's lots of different ways of doing it, much like Drupal. This is kind of the way I settled into it. Um, there are handlers in Ansible. Handlers are basically things that are going to run at the end. If, you, if you're installing a server, you're configuring Apache, you're probably going to be making a lot of changes along the way where you're going to have to restart Apache at the end. You don't want to have to restart it every single time you're making those changes. So at the end, the handlers um, actually go out and it, they all get saved up and at the end, all the handlers get run so that way you're only restarting something once at the very end instead of multiple times, which you don't need to do. Um, roles are kind of groups of tasks. So once again, I might have a role that it sets up Apache. I might have a role that sets up fail to ban, something else. So that's a group of tasks that you all want to achieve a certain goal. Um, so, once again, to use a fail to ban example, this is, this is my role in here. There's basically three tasks that are installing it, setting up my, my, my local file, and adding a Drupal spamicide filter, which is a really cool thing if you haven't done it. If you're using a spamicide module for Drupal, you can have that logged to your server. And then fail to ban, if you set up rules for it, if, say, we, say there's three failed attempts at a login form, it kicks that IP at, um, off the server for 24 hours, or how long you configure it for, which greatly reduces spam and load on your server. So another very cool thing. Um, so then you have all of these things are grouped into playbooks. Um, so I have a playbook that configures servers. I have a playbook that does Drupal stuff. I have a playbook for rebuilding the site that I'm currently working on. So this is an example of um, the, the way Ansible works. You, you, you have like a, a site.yaml file, which is kind of the, the, the main file to run where you're defining your roles, I want to build, I want to install, I want to do my dev setup, and I want to call my handlers, point my, my um, table to you know, say where the handlers are actually stored. Um, you set things with variables. So once again, things are reusable. Um, you, you can have a variables file in many different locations. Any, any of your tasks, any of your roles, your handlers, they can all use variables so you can pass into them. So it's very configurable. Um, e values, very easy. You set the name, colon, value, away you go. Um, there's a few different places for them. Like I said, it uh, depends on whether you want it for a specific host, a specific group of hosts, various ways into that. I won't get too um, detailed into that. Um, here's an example of a variables file where all of these are going to be passed into the various tasks that are a part of my playbook, um, which keeps things very consistent. And yes, I've changed them all to protect the innocent. I'm not going to put all my passwords out here for you guys. So, Drupal install profiles. Who works with install profiles then? Anyone? Yeah, cool. Well, whether or, no, whether or not you, you know it, you have worked with install profiles because when you install Drupal, you're picking an install profile. By default, Drupal has two install profiles, a so standard and minimal. And when you're first setting it up, it actually runs those install profiles to configure Drupal according to what those profiles say. So an install profile installs modules, it configures things, it in, in, installs themes. It basically sets up a site the way you want it set up. So in my case, I'm building a whole client site out, but I have an install profile that installs all the custom features, all the custom modules, all the custom themes, sets everything up, meaning that you can start over from fresh every single time and get the same exact site every single time. Um, yeah, so a, a lot of them are starting points. Um, like, you know, there's lots of in install profiles out there on Drupal.org that you can download and use. Um, shameless plug for mine on uh, GitHub, which is a great starting point for your sites to help configure things along the way, the tasty backend. But then there's other things that do a lot more for you. Like, for instance, if you installed Commerce Kickstart 2, you can essentially just put in products and away you go in a lot of things. Um, and there's other more full-featured install profiles out there, open and things like that. Some are quite small that do minor things, some are quite large. 
or you can build your own that configures the site for a client the way you want. So why, in the end, would you want to do this? Because it, it's really complicated. Yeah, I want to make my life really difficult and miss my deadlines because I'm going to, instead of just clicking things around and uploading a database, I'm going to build an install profile. Actually, it's, it's not. Um, if you've done any Drupal dev and you look into modules and you go, oh, I don't really know what's going on, look at some of the core install profiles and just read through the install hook. It's actually really easy. And even if you don't understand everything, it's a good starting place for Drupal dev in general because it's all pretty well documented and you can kind of see the, the, the steps that are being taken during the install and how things are being configured. It's actually pretty easy. And once you get into the habit of putting things into an install profile, the actual additional time in development is quite small because this, it basically means my, my workflow is more create something, make sure it's in code, make sure I, I add it to the profile dependencies so it gets installed. There we go. And so there's, there, there's not a whole lot of extra work once you get used to it. Um, and it means that once again there's no configuration mishaps because if you screw something up you can rebuild. And it also means that you can restructure without leaving leftover cruft in your site. I mean how often do you have a site you're working on and there's one of four or five different modules that you might want to try. And what do you do? You download and you try them all, oh, that doesn't work, you uninstall, or whatever. And there's going to be stuff left over. On this particular project, it's, uh, it was done with Ubercart in Drupal 6, and I was planning on moving it to Commerce in, in Drupal 7. And originally when I set up the install profile, it was downloading and configuring Commerce along the way. And then when I really got into the migrations, I was having a massive problem. Because uh, Commerce, there's there's a, there's a migrate module for Ubercart to Commerce, which only really works well with a one-to-one -one kind of product display and product relationship, where this site in Drupal 6 was relying heavily on the attributes that Ubercart provides in Drupal 6. And big warning on the, on the, the Ubercart migrate module, um, saying it doesn't support attributes, and I was having a nightmare of a time with that. So I ended up going, well, you know what? Ubercart works great for what they're doing. Ubercart does work great in Drupal 7. I don't have to use Commerce. It's going to be the same system they're used to. I don't have to reconfigure everything. So I swapped it out. Boom. I just changed, I changed my, my make file to download Ubercart instead of Commerce. I changed my profile dependencies to install Ubercart instead of Commerce. I rebuilt the site. No trace that, that Drupal Commerce was ever on the site whatsoever. So no cruft. And you can swap anything out, like I said, if you're testing around modules. Um, we had a recent user group meeting in Brighton um, where somebody was telling me about all these different modules he was trying. And I was like, you're not doing that on a live site, are you? Because you might end up with a bunch of leftover stuff in there or whatever else. And he's like, no, 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 but it just, no, but it just means that you can try stuff out. And then, cool, I, I settled on this solution, add that module to your profile. And then when you rebuild, none of anything else that you tested out is there at all. So. Integration between Drupal and Ansible. There isn't any. <laughs> so how does this all work? Well, there actually is. Trash. Because once again, I was saying if you can run, out, if you can do it on the command line, you can most likely do it in Drupal or in, in Ansible. So Ansible has the command and shell modules, which basically just run commands or run something through a shell like you normally would. Um, and in that is where we get where I'm getting anyway, the, the Drush integration with Ansible. This is how Ansible is now talking to Drupal. Um, so for example, the classic Drush command, querying it. Now, there's different ways of doing this with Ansible because with, with, with Drush, you, you need to run it up against a certain site. You have to either be in that directory to manually do it or you have to use aliases or point it at something. Now, there's three different ways of that I've been doing this with Ansible, um, and I'll show you the one I've settled on. But Drush has a method of doing that right now by saying specify minus r and then point it to the actual directory that the root directory of your Drupal install, which means that this doc root variable is set, excuse me, to be the path of my Drupal site, saying Drush move into this directory, clear the cache. That's one way of doing it. But I wouldn't normally do this at a command line, so I'd say. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't normally do this in day-to-day -day life, but it works, it works well here. A second way to do it is a more Ansible way, where you can say Drush CC all, but change directory in here. Cool. That means that Ansible is going to change into a directory, then run the Drush command. And this is more consistent with the way I would normally do things, typing things out manually. Um, I wouldn't you know, have this minus R or whatever. I wouldn't normally do that. But it still has this, 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 this 
bit at the end that I wouldn't want to type normally. So the third way of doing it, which I just realized the other day, is you can set arguments for a command. So now the command is exactly the way that I would write it out myself, which is great for consistency. When I'm reading things, I understand immediately what it does because I'm used to it. And I'm telling Ansible to change directories into this through the argument, which, once again, I'm still fairly new-ish um, to Ansible, so I'm still discovering kind of the best ways of doing things. And some of the code I'll probably show, you'll see differences of ways of doing things in Drush, all three of these ways. But moving forward, I will be using this way. Um, this is kind of what I'm going to settle with. So, putting it all together. Once again, I need to rebuild a lot during this. I also want to rebuild a lot during this to make sure everything is consistent. Um, so doing so, because also, <laughs> let me mention this, I royally screwed up the site a couple times working on my migration. Um, migrate modules get, can be quite fiddly if you change the structure of your classes or names or anything else. And as much as I was Drush Dr. Draying, so Drush, the develop module has a Dray command which uninstalls, which disables a module, uninstalls a module, and reinstalls a module. Um, I, I white screened to death numerous times. Like, oh crap, my site is broken. Screw it, rebuild, it's all right. So basically for my local stuff, I need to build, I need to install, and I need to set things up locally as a dev setup. So there's gonna be doing things, I want to do things during development that I don't want to do live. So I have these three roles for what I'm building locally as I work. So here's an example of what I'm doing to build locally. Once again, I'm saying run this on my local host where I have variables set for that that are set elsewhere. Run my build, run my install, run my dev setup. Boom, everything is back. So, so the build basically removes the root directory. It builds everything from a Drush make file. So everything starts over from fresh. Everything gets pulled down from Drupal.org. Everything comes through exactly the way it should. If somehow I was looking at a file and I added a semicolon somewhere, it doesn't matter. It's gone. So to do that, quite simple. I use the Ansible file module. I say, get rid of this. And then I run a Drush make file with this command and point it towards that directory. And here's some other things I need to pass into Drush site install, or Drush make, to be able to get things to work properly on my um, laptop. And this concurrency problem is such a nightmare. I'm not gonna get into that. If you ever face that, just cry. I did. So then after that, what do I wanna do? I wanna install. So I need to do it a lot. I'm not doing it manually. Um, I also needed an extra database to my settings file for the migration. You can store that in various places if you're doing a migrate, but I like to put it in the settings file. And which also means that after I'm installing Drupal through um, Drush site install, it's only going to want to originally put one database setting in there. So I set up Ansible to then add the second database to it automatically so I don't have to manually do that every single time. So it means that, that my Drupal site automatically connects to the current database, it connects to the Drupal 6 database, and I don't have to worry about it. I know it's going to happen. Um, so I have, an extra, I have an extra template, like a separate one for settings PHP, which passes in the variables for my legacy Drupal 6 database after I install. And it does things like get the Drupal hash salt value, which Drupal sets during install, and puts it into this new settings PHP to make sure all that works all okay. So here's an example of my install where I'm saying install Drupal, which is basically just saying running Drush site install. It's installing the profile name, it's got all the, the database user information, where all it is, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot going on there in that. Um, it gets the Drupal hash salt value, overwrites the settings file. That's it. Drupal is installed. It's ready to go. So dev setup. Once again, things I want locally that I don't want elsewhere. Um, stuff new during development. You know, I want to install the develop module. I want to have reroute email on just in case. Stuff like that. Um, I want to create a, a, a demo user that automatically has a few roles added to it. So I can always test how my clients are going to interact with the site because never, ever, ever, ever give your clients full administration access. Bad news. So it, it does all this for me. So it's, it's easy for me just to like go, all right, cool. I got this demo user. I can log in. I can make sure the menus are okay. The access is okay. I can test all that stuff manually quite easily. And it creates a sim link to point to my external files directory because once again, I don't have a space on here. So once again, enable my development modules, set up Drush to our Set develop to show machine names, I like that, so it should say develop. Um, set up my, my reroute email module with my um, settings for that. It creates my demo user, which is actually installing a module, but I can do that through Drush. I'm going to replace that. I assign my roles to the user through Drush here. 
I set git to ignore all of, like file permission changes and stuff like that. Uh, remove the files directory, create the sim link, make sure features directory is writable so I can use the export stuff from the UI. And you know what? I'm gonna clear the cache just because. <laughs> That's one of those things. The Drupal, something, you know, just clear the cache. That way you know. So, hey, it works. Yay. So then I did all this work and I went, oh yeah, all the clients want to see it, don't they? I gotta put it somewhere for them to look at it. And I go, oh, I got this complicated setup, it's all built and and all this other stuff. And I went, well, actually, all I had to do was change the variables, point the playbook at the server instead of locally, and run it. Happy days! It all just worked. And yeah, that's double fonts for anybody keeping track. Um, which was amazing. I, I literally danced around my office when that happened because I was like, this is amazing. I don't have to do anything separate. I use the same exact playbook. I use the same exact configuration. I know it's going to work the same exact way. And all I have to do is say, instead of doing this here, do this, um, and cool, it worked. So the, so the server build um, has a few extra steps because I normally um, manually do, do my migrations locally to kind of test stuff and I have this post install and I have an extra stage set up role here as well because there's certain things I want to install on the server that I don't want on my, on my development. But it shares everything else. So it shares the build, it shares the install, it shares the dev setup, which I won't need, but I'm just keeping it on the staging server just in case. Um, it performs my migrations and I have a post install here as well because I think maybe in eight we're gonna get a post install hook for install profiles so it's like after something after the installation has completely run, sometimes you might want to enable something else. I have a module that creates loads of menu items that are based on the items that were migrated. So I, I can't do that before the migration. I have to do that after the migration. So I e enable that here after my migration. So it means all the nodes are pulled in, I run my post install, it installs the module, it creates all my menus for me. Sweet. Um, so the, the stage setup role I'm using, it basically installs a shield module so people can't um, you know, look at my site, whatever. I don't need that locally, but I'm a, I'm a, it's, a, it's a public web server, so that way it, it protects it, where I'm basically just setting that up through Drush vset, and it loops over these items to um, set the username and password and all that for shield. It, it disables error reporting to the screen because clients are checking this out, and just in case there's something up there that's kind of screwy, which there probably is, I don't want them to see those errors, but locally I want to see those errors. So these are things I don't want on my dev setup, but I do want in my stage setup. Cool. <laughs> and it runs my, my migrations for me. I have two separate migrations going, one from Drupal going, one from Drupal 6 into Drupal 7. And then I have a custom migration going, which is feeding in new data from CSV files and maybe updating things after they've already been imported and things like that. So I can specify that it runs this uh, runs the initial Drupal 6 to 7 migration first. Then it, it pulls in the, the custom stuff. And then a really screwy thing because Ubercart doesn't support migrations very well. It supports upgrades from six to seven. But for various other reasons, I don't want to upgrade from six to seven because other things break. So I have this screwy thing that dumps tables from, the up, from an upgraded Drupal six to seven site and then re-imports them into this site after the fact. Sounds mental. Big thanks to Longway. I don't see if he's in here today. Um, for helping me and IRC to actually work my way through that. So, because of that, we have bonus magnets. And I was so disappointed that Blink tab doesn't work anymore, but I was able to Google this and make things blink again, which is all CSS as well. So, hey, once again, happy days. Um, so, yeah, I have to upgrade the site to, from D6 to D7. You're going to go, well, yeah, once again, why would you do that? You're having this migration. I need these certain tables to run through Drupal's upgrade procedure from 6 to 7 to format the data correctly. So then I have another <laughs> role that, that well, puts stretch aliases on the server, it drops all the old databases, it creates new ones, once again, removes the root directories, it clones the D6 site from the, from the current repo, it, it, it downloads Drupal 7 into a separate directory, it syncs the databases up from 6 to 7, runs a whole Drupal 6 to 7 upgrade, including disabling all the contrib modules, um, changing the code. It basically does stuff that Drush site upgrade does, but I couldn't get Drush site upgrade to work consistently locally or on the server, but I thought, well, I'm Ansible here. I can do all the steps that it's doing. 
with Ansible, and there's, there's no problem with that. So it syncs the database from site to here, it creates temporary files it, that need to change in the database, upgrades the modules, disables non core modules, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, dumps my database tables to a space that my other role can then re-import later on. Sounds mad. It is mad. But I don't want to have to remember to do this. How am I going to know? You know, over and over again. I need to test this over and over again. And right before going live, I want to get all the latest data out and do this again. I don't want to do this manually. So I spent some time putting this together. So a full upgrade from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, all automated, all completely with, with perfectly fresh data off the database every single time, off, off the live DB. So this also means that going live, what do I have to do? Reuse all of the stuff I've already written. Maybe add a live setup role to this, so it's going to you know, enable CSS aggregation and stuff like that. Um, and then hosting as well. I, I'm probably going to end up hosting this site, but hey, I've got other playbooks that set up the servers as well. So all I got to do is run those. I have, a, I have a new server. It takes five minutes. Run this. Boom. Everything is live. And it's all reusable. Now, downsides with this is when you're running these, you don't get output. Well, you can, but it's not readable. And there's issues for Ansible about providing readable output, but they're not going to do it, basically. Um, so you can, you can go verbose all the way up to ver 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 verbose um, to be able to see the output. It's not very user-friendly to read, but if, if you need to see what's going on, you can do so. Um, and a big bonus, which I was very disappointed in, is you can't show the Drupalcon during Drush site install. Because my old shell scripts I was using, I always set that up, but it means that after a successful install using um, Drush, you see this. <laughs> so it's very sad. I no longer get to see DrupalCon all the time, but oh well, there's trade-offs for everything, isn't there? So in conclusion, what this has done is given me better Drupal, because it's consistent. I know it is every single time. No cruff. And it gives me smart management, a good way to smartly manage all of this stuff, from build, through staging, through live, through the server. Everything is configured in here. And you know what this all stands for? A bit of BDSM, which is always good for everyone. <laughs> so um, other Ansible kind of Drupal stuff um, outside of Phil's Vlad, which is amazing. Um, I've written about something called Drupal Update Check, which goes out and checks all of my Drupal sites for available updates. I have maintenance contracts for various sites and stuff like that for security updates. So I have those configured to only send out emails um, when there are security updates available for the Drupal sites. But I don't want to leave update module enabled on the server because it just takes up resources and every once in a while you get that really long page load and stuff like that. So I have a Drupal update check um, Ansible role that you just feed it a list of sites you want it to check, and when you run it, it goes out to the server, it enables the update module, it, runs, it, 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 it checks for updates, it runs Tron, so it sends the emails out, and then it, it disables everything and deletes all the last run variables so I can run it over and over and over again and check which sites actually need updates. Because that way I'm like, well, I got these 30 sites to update. Which ones have security updates? I can't remember if it's a contrib module, which, which one of these sites is actually going to have this module installed. So I, I, I run that, it goes out, it checks all the sites, and it emails me from all the sites saying, these are the five sites that have updates available. Now I know on that Thursday morning, um, I've got to update those five sites, and I don't have to worry about the rest of them, because I know they don't have any security updates available, otherwise this would have emailed me. And I have another one that I use sometimes called Drupal Performance, which basically just goes out to all of the same sites and just double checks that things like caching and CSS and JavaScript aggregation are turned on. And if they're not turned on, it turns them on. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a nice little double check, especially, like, I don't know about you, but whenever I'm like, out in the wild on the web and I, I, I land across a, a Drupal site, the first thing I do is view source. And seriously, nine times out of 10, nobody has this stuff turned on. Like, even like, these big agencies, it's like, turn this on. Why, why don't you have you know, CSS aggregation turned on? Come on, it's easy. This way, it just, it just double checks, it just makes sure. You know, not, not that any of my sites should ever have it turned off, but who knows? Maybe there was a weird thing that happened, and for some reason at 2 o'clock in the morning, I had to log into the site and do something, whatever. There we go. Run that, um, and it's always there. So some resources, um, ansible.com for all things Ansible. There's, um, the docs.ansible.com is really great. shows you how to do everything, um, running all your modules, etc. 
And there's also galaxy.ansible.com, which you can find roles and things that other people have written to incorporate into your own, into your own uh, playbooks. So there's lots of good resources out there to be able to reuse what some things that other people have written um, as well. So I figured after talking about all this, there's always a great opportunity for demo fail. So I'm going to run this. Um, and it, it takes a little while, so I figure we can have questions if anybody has any while we're watching Terminal, because who doesn't like watching stuff in Terminal, right? So here's the structure of one of my playbooks. See, I have this site upgrade thing which runs. I have my stage and I have my, my main kind of site one which builds things locally. So I'm going to want to run this stage and rebuild. This is going to go out, rebuild it on the server, do all the migrations, configure everything. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to do something silly. And I'm going to kill the site. So that was this site here. Okay, so now you can see the site's broken. Otherwise, you could, I could just run this and you wouldn't know, and it just magically works. But this is, as you can see, this is up on my server. Um, so now the site is completely killed, completely bored. So to run this, we just use the Ansible playbook command. We specify the, the host file. We're going to run the staging rebuild, and we need to use sudo. So And it's going to run. Like I said, this is going to take a little while, um, which is, you know, I kind of really like watching all this stuff. But so does anybody have any questions while this is running? Yes. Um, part of the playbook is using a lot of um, preset variables and that thing for the label caching and the model. Um, one thing I tend to do normally is part of the setting is update the stage is include um, dollar com mm -hmm. variable space. Yes, that essentially run VTEC and code. Yeah. Um, if you're not doing that at all, because it's maybe just take a lot of that stuff out of the playbook into the um, type system. Yeah, it, yeah, it, you can totally do that. I could put that into my settings file. Maybe I'll do that when I go live for certain things. Um, I don't know, in, in the past I haven't often done that. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it is, it's a great way of keeping things consistent on the live site, definitely. Yeah. Um, so. You just don't end up in a situation then where caching and computers are being stable. Yeah. Yeah, sure, yeah. They can't do yeah. it. Yeah. Um, well, for that, if, you, if you look at using um, the master module for storing um, site specific modules in the gradient, just that then turns into a set um, different state around uh, different chunks for local staging, registration, mm. caching, which module you make on each. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, and then if you just run a master section command on each of them, it goes, oh, you don't have this Oh, uh, sweet. Else, okay. Oh, cool. So that's, that's just called master module. Yeah. I will definitely look in. I will definitely look into that. Thank you. Excuse me. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I'm just wondering about content. You say you have a, a, a site that a client is actually populating with content. Yeah. And you want to then rebuild it in your instance. Yeah. How do you get that content? How do you export? Do you want to export? Well. I, I wouldn't kill the database on a site that's actually live. <laughs> See, this is all this is all development and kind of deployment staging and stuff like that. So after after things go live, I'll run Drush Make to kind of rebuild the code base to pull in latest updates for modules and stuff like that. But I'm not going to reinstall. So would you then would you fetch the database from the live server? Um, I, I haven't settled completely on how I'm going to do all of that, but the idea is basically rebuild a separate code based on the server and then just point it at the, at the old database, or I could, I could duplicate it as well if I wanted to. Um, I haven't quite come to that conclusion yet. I mean, there's going to be a few ways to do it. So, but it's just, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to get in a situation where I'm exporting all of the data and re-importing it. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to do all of that. This, is, this was basically done to help me during development. Um, moving forward, I'll definitely write stuff to help maintain this. Um, but as far as the content goes, I'm, I'm just not gonna. I'm not gonna trash the live database. I will have backups for backups for backups for that. So just just to make sure all that's um, still there. Um, but it, theoretically, you, you could you could do stuff like that. You could completely rebuild the site, and you could migrate. You could write migrations from the old seven database into the new one, stuff like that. But. Mm. Okay. And then what 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I, like, I basically started using this because I was using it for other things, and I was like, I don't want to learn yet another thing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to do like as much stuff with Ansible as I can, because also I get it, and I, I like using it, and I think it's fun to watch this, and um, I just find it, you know, instantly, you know, it's all reusable and everything else. I just, I just, I've enjoyed using it since I started with it, so I'm trying to do, just keep all my stuff in there if I can. Um, and, and since it works good, you know, with, like I said, with you know, running things on the command line, if there isn't a Ansible module for it, you can if you can fire off commands on it, you can do it. So you can continue to do more and more things with it, even if Ansible doesn't officially support it. Any others? I was hoping there was going to be more questions because this is going to take a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, like I said, I haven't been doing Ansible stuff that long. Um, I've actually purposely stayed away from Galaxy to force me to write this stuff so I'll learn it. I've downloaded various other roles off of GitHub and places to look for how people are doing things. Um, I do have one in my normal server playbook that installs Drush, um, but in the, in, in the end, I purposely have not used a lot of other code because I wanted to get used to doing it myself. So I think. I'm probably at a point now where I'm going to start looking more into so I don't have to manually do it all. But once again, like one of the things I like about it is that I know exactly what's going into everything. Um, I was talking earlier about setting up servers on DigitalOcean and how DigitalOcean has various images that you can pick and choose from, like a pre-configured Mac stack or, or whatever else. And when I first started doing Ansible stuff, a lot of it was just for server setup. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I knew every step of everything going into the server. Because um, if you just use somebody else's, you, you know, some of their image, you might not know exactly how it's set up. And at least this way, even if it's not perfect, I know exactly what's gone into it. So I'll know exactly what to change, hopefully, if something goes wrong along the way. So, yeah, so actually, so yeah, so we've installed Drupal. It's doing some of the setup. It's installing Shield, etc. It's um, running through my dev stuff. Okay, cool. We're assigning roles to the demo user. I can kill this as well if anybody's bored. Can I just ask a bit of an, uh, a newbie question while this is happening? Just can you describe what Shield module does? Please? Um, Shield module. You know, the, um, you can set up like HD access access to a server. It just pops up that box that says username and password. Yeah. I think when I, when I refresh the site after this is done, it'll show it to you. It just it just locks off the site from the public, so it's actually you know, like server control over it versus well, I guess it runs through Drupal, but um, it just means that to actually get to the Drupal site to see any of it, you have to enter a username and password. It just keeps Google off of it and keeps prying eyes off of it. Keeps Google off completely. Yeah, so well, it's, it's, if you can't access the site, you can't index it, can you? Right. <laughs> so so yeah, it's it, Shield module is good for stuff like that. Yes. Um, you suggested that that there was mm, uh, problem with out. Yeah. Uh, is that something you can talk about? Well, I, if, if, if I ran this in verbose mode, you'd see that it's like, so like, like Drush is going to say, this, just, this was just enabled successfully or something like that, right? So that's what you normally get from the output of Drush. It's, it's, it's a nice kind of reminder things are going well. Mm -hmm. Well, like, as you can see, we're not, we're not getting that. It just says it's changed. Like, that's still in there. You can access it. Like, a, a good idea, if it's really important, you can log all that stuff. Write all that stuff that comes back out into a log if you need to check it later on. Right. You can do that. But it's just that for things like, like when I first, like if you're installing, like there's one of these where if you look at the output, it just comes out like this, and it's all in like lines with like a bunch of, like, you know, formatting that I don't understand. So it's, it's really hard to read. So it's, it's not ideal in that. So it's one of those things where debugging and stuff like that, I'll have verbose mode turned on, and I'll, you know, manually call, crawl through all that stuff. So then afterwards, I don't want to have to look at all that crap. <laughs> So I just have this. Okay, cool. So we're we're up to migration. So it's getting all the all the data from Drupal six. And you'll see up here when I was setting um, the shield, shield module, these are temporary usernames and passwords. So after I do this again, you guys won't be able to access the site. <laughs> <laughs> I was very careful in making sure that all my passwords and stuff like that that I used for the stuff was all in variables. I'm not going to show you guys. 
But, but, but this, is all running, what, what, this is all running off of my laptop as well, on my server, which is all being authenticated through SSH keys. So I don't need any usernames or anything for, for stuff like that, which is really cool. Um, and I've got my local SSH set up to pass my keys, so if it needs to clone something or any, anything else, I don't have to have separate keys set up on a server or anything like that, since it's all running off of my laptop. Which is pretty cool. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if I was going to put yeah. this, I wouldn't commit my, if I was going to put this in a public so facing. I've read a couple different things about it. I think, you know, I, I think, I'm not 100% sure what, what best practices are. I think just don't commit your stuff that you don't <laughs> want other people to see. But that's why variables can be stored in separate directories or separate files, or you can have them pointed to a completely separate directory on your laptop or wherever. Right. Yeah. So if you need to store sensitive information, you don't have to include that in the playbook. Um, now, a lot of this is me going, like, I need to get this crap done, so a lot of it's going in there. Um, and it's all, you know, privately, you know, yeah. private bitbucket repos and stuff like that, so no one else is going to get to that stuff. Um, but yeah, there's, there's various ways of doing that to make sure that sensitive data doesn't get pushed out into that. And, you know, I think um, I, can do, I can definitely do a lot more work on this to make things more generic and use more variables. And I'm still also trying to figure out best practices in that, because sometimes you end up with like, a variables list like this big, and I don't want to have to set, you know, 50 seven different variables to run something. So I'm still kind of working through how to best optimize it and best practices and stuff like that as well. I do realize that we're like r running way over here and stuff like that as well. So I mean, I can definitely kill this. It's it's just basically gonna hopefully work, and the site will come back up, and that's it. So if we need to move on, I'll shut my mouth and move on. <laughs> make a cup of tea and stuff like that in the office. You know, I only do this like, you know, at the end of the day or something like that. So it's kind of like that. So it's kind of like, all right, I, I want to deploy all the stuff I've done. So I'm, I'm not sitting here running this every 10 minutes, otherwise I wouldn't get anything done. Like in the beginning, I end up running things a lot because you're like, okay, this is new. I wanted to like test everything, especially if it's kind of rebuilding locally and stuff like that. But since I've added like the migration, especially, you can see how long it takes. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty big site. Um, uh, the old one, there's thousands and thousands of nodes and thousands of files, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, it does take a little bit, but, but once again, I know that, like, it's, you know, as long as the internet doesn't go down, it should all complete perfectly. And I, I tested it in the hotel last night, and it worked, so. <laughs> <laughs> what happens if the internet connection fails? Do you pick up where you left off? Um, Well, you can start at various places. I mean, there's different ways of running the playbooks um, with yeah. tags and stuff like that. Um, or specifying just, you know, which ones you actually want to run. Um, so part of part of actually writing your playbooks is coming up with different files that can do different things that all run the same roles but in different things. So like I have, I have my main one that kind of builds locally, but then I had my staging setup um, file which only runs which runs the things in the order I want for staging. So for live, I'll have another one that runs all the same roles but might have an extra one in. So in, in theory, I could go, oh, this just crashed at the migrate, so I can create a file really quick that only runs the migrate and from there on out. Yeah. So I can, I can easily use, just do something like that when it takes long. I don't think I set it up like that. <laughs> um, folks do 
you can set conditions like like when things fail, or or when to skip, or things along those lines. One of the one of the funny things in the whole crazy Ubercart upgrade is that one of the steps always fails um, because there's some sort of field that wants to get created that's already there and it's, it's well documented. But like it's one of those things that fails. But if you just if it's it fails when it's trying to install all the Ubercart Drupal seven modules. But it's one of those things that like you know it fails, but then if you if you try it again, everything works. So the nice thing about this is that I just have ignore errors set to true on, on, on that part of that, that playbook. So when it's installing all those, I know it's going to fail. So my next task after that is install all these again because it failed previously. <laughs> and it works. So it's like, that's a nice thing that you can set up and say, okay, it's, 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 it's going to work at this point. So I can just say, just forget about it. Because if, if I do it again, it'll work. Um, so. Have you looked at any uh, things that you know, definitely you know, do's and don'ts? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think, like, once again, I, I think I'm still trying to kind of figure out how to how to best use it. But it's just it's one of those things. I'm I'm just trying to think of more things to do with it. Um, I'd rather enjoy using it and stuff. So um, I'd say do use it and don't not use it. Those are those, those are my do's and don'ts. <laughs> oh look, check it out. Yeah, so S S. So right now it's enabling my um, my utility module, which creates the menus, which I really should rename to be a menu module because there's nothing else in there. I've been a bit scatterbrained the past couple of months working on this. To be perfectly honest with you. Yay! A shield module. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to do anything else because I'm way over time and stuff like that. But um, so thank you very much. Um, where's my shameless self plug sort of stuff? Um, that's all my info. Um, get in touch. Follow me on Twitter. Hire me. I'm a freelancer. Um, <laughs> all that good stuff. Always looking for my next meals to be fed to me. So yes. Um, yeah. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.